My name is John Parent, and I'm the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Before we get into some of our introductions and uh, a statement that I'm going to make, let me go through a few ground rules uh, so we know how we're operating. Number one, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from members from the state first, and then we'll hear. My name is John Parent, and I'm the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Before we get into some of our introductions and uh, a statement that I'm going to make, let me go through a few ground rules uh, so we know how we're operating. Number one, what we're going to do is we're going to hear from members from the state first, and then we'll hear from local uh, officials from the town. We'd like you to save all of your questions uh, for the question and answer period, which will follow all of the speakers. By doing that, we'll be sure to have all of the presentations on a timely basis. As always, we ask you to be courteous and respectful of the presenters and your fellow residents. We do have a microphone on my right. If you do wish to speak during the question and answer period, please give us your name and address. If there are any non-Hudson residents in the audience, I'm not going to recognize them. This is a meeting for the Hudson residents only. If there are out-of-towners in the audience, that's fine, uh, but we want to reserve our time for Hudson residents. Please ask only one question and limit your time at the microphone so that others who have questions may ask them during the question and answer period. We will accept the final question at 7.45. Once it's answered, the state and local officials will make themselves available in the cafeteria for an open house. They'll have additional information and fact sheets that they can share with you. During the open house, if you're not able to speak with the staff at a certain table due to time constraints, please provide them or the legislative, legislative office with your contact information so that someone may follow up with an answer or information. If you have not already done so, we would appreciate your signing in at the table in the back or you can sign in if you visit one of the tables. Let me make a brief statement and then we'll introduce our guests this evening. And I do want to welcome particularly uh, the people who have come here from the state. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to get some additional information and obviously for the citizens of Hudson to get some additional information as well. On behalf of the board, we welcome the state officials and our residents to this water forum, which was arranged by Representative Kate Hogan. Although Hudson recently had a public meeting on the PFAS issue, since then, much has transpired and will occur as the DEP and the municipal water suppliers cope with this emerging contaminant and evolving cutting edge treatment technologies. It's a complex, scientific, legal, and political problem. I want to acknowledge and thank Hudson's talented team of professionals. Tom Moses, our executive assistant, Eric Ryder, the DPW director, and his water supply operators. Tom and Eric have been aptly evaluating and planning the execution of the town's responses to the PFAS problem for many months. In addition, Woodard and Curran's water supply engineers and Mackie Shea, our special environmental counsel. I also want to acknowledge Mass DEP's central regional director, Mary Judge Pigsley, and her water supply and waste site cleanup staff, who are working closely with Hudson to require private parties to install a temporary treatment system at the Cranberry Bog Well 
and we just received approval to proceed with the town's proposed temporary system at the Chessman treatment plant. The regional director, Mary Jude, has been on the front line in several communities on the PFAS problem. I also thank Commissioner Martin Stuberg for his leadership on PFAS and for partnering with us to address this challenging issue on multiple fronts. And I look forward to hearing about DEP short, mid, and long-term strategies. We all recognize clean, safe drinking water is the essential to life. And I was surprised to learn that PFAS is already present in 98% of the U.S. population from historic exposures to useful products and to waste disposal practices. I take little comfort in knowing that Hudson is not alone in responding to this nationwide problem. There are other Massachusetts municipalities facing exactly the same challenges as Hudson. And I hope the towns can pull their knowledge and experiences for the benefit of all water suppliers. The costs for this challenging problem with temporary and then later permanent treatment systems will be many millions of dollars in each affected community. And the town will work with Representative Hogan and Senator Eldridge to obtain critical funding for dealing with this public health threat. In addition, Sutton Hudson will seek recovery of its costs from all responsible parties. The public also now has access data on the private wells that have been tested by Geosyntec. All of those wells have tested below 70 parts per trillion. That data is located in the DEP 21E database under release tracking number 2-0020439. This database contains a wealth of information and I would strongly recommend that you go into it. If after the meeting you want to see me uh, to understand how to get into that particular database, grab me and I'll give you the link to follow to get into that data. The town pledges to keep up the hard work and to keep our residents informed. We'll act quickly and appropriately to deal with the unfortunate hand that we've been dealt by the manufacturing and business sectors. And I hope and I expect we will all learn a lot tonight from Regional Director Pigsley and Commissioner Suberg. At this point, what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce our local team, and they are our executive assistant, Tom Moses, our Department of Public Works Director, Eric Ryder, Facilities Manager for the School Department, Len Belli, our Director of the uh, Health Department, Kelly Kaylo, I had to think for a second, Kelly, I'm sorry, uh, Selectman Fred Lucy, Selectman Jim Quinn, Selectman Scott DePlesia, and Selectman Joe Durant. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate and let her introduce our state guests. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would also like to say right now that we are uh, taping this forum and it will be on uh, cable, it will be on HUD TV. Thank you so much for doing this in such a short, uh, with such short notice. We're very, very grateful. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to the Board of Selectmen, to the Hudson High Superintendent Rodriguez and staff, especially Denise Reed, who really helped to make this happen. My own staff for spending hours and hours to make sure that we were able to put together uh, the programming that we needed, have the technology that we needed, and work closely uh, with, with Hudson uh, Town Hall and with uh, Hudson High. 
Um, thank you, HUD TV, for taping it this evening. I know that there are a number of people here tonight, but I have heard from many, many people who cannot make it tonight and are looking uh, for information and will be looking for the HUD TV uh, recording uh, when, it's, when it's released as, as soon as possible. And thank you, thank you, thank you to all the constituents who have reached out uh, with questions and concerns. And I hope that here tonight what we're saying is we hear you, I hear you, and uh, we are looking to move forward. Um, I would like to welcome to Hus Hudson the DEP Commissioner, Marty Suberg. He is a stand-up guy. He has been with me through a number of water issues uh, and DEP environmental issues uh, over the years and has always been willing to not only work uh, with myself and Jamie, but also work closely uh, with communities to get the information out that's needed um, almost at any juncture. To the uh, Department of Environmental Protection Regional Director, Mary Jude Pigsley, uh, we have been working and talking almost daily um, around what might be going on here and there. It keeps us all informed, and um, she has been a great asset to the town. I'm grateful to both DEP Environmental Analyst Jessica Burkhammer is also here. I'd like to have a shout out to uh, ORS Executive Director Allison Field Juma. I asked her to be here this evening. Uh, we deal with watersheds and, and water doesn't know boundaries, so I wanted uh, those folks that work closely with water to have an understanding of uh, what's going on with our water issues here. And we know. Um, I also wanted to um, introduce and will introduce Senator Jamie Eldridge um, after I make some brief remarks and I'm glad that we can all be here this evening. These water issues before us are health and safety issues and they affect every one of us. Our families rely on local and state government to monitor our water. Our small businesses rely on the same water to create jobs, serve residents in the town. Our towns need to be vigilant and work to ensure we are drinking clean water, and that is why we are here today to update you on the solutions and, yes, even the challenges in both the short, mid, and long term as we deal with this water issue. Our DEP, Department of Public Health, Board of Selectmen, DPW, Board of Health, all are working to meet and achieve uh, these goals of making sure that there are no readings in the water at the end of this challenge. The goal for every person here is clean water, and that means no PFA readings for Hudson. So before I introduce Senator Jamie Eldridge, I want to announce that I will be filing legislation in the next few weeks to create a mass PFAS task force to determine the extent of the current crisis in cities and towns across our region and state to alert and educate our local officials, legislators, and constituents, and make the investments necessary to protect our water supply today and for the future. All while working closely with recently convened federal PFAS task force. This is all time sensitive and we are very, very aware of that. It's a top priority for our district, and I think it is now getting the attention it deserves and needs at the State House, and we won't stop pushing on this until the problem is solved and people are all held accountable. Mass PFAS Task Force specifically will include DEP, DPH, MEMA, Fire Marshals, the Attorney General, EOPS, MMA, legislators, water experts, and scientists with knowledge of PFAS and all six of the contaminants. The task force will gather and review information regarding known locations of PFAS, detection in mass, and create a response plan. And that will be for all of the state, so that a town like Hudson is not sitting with a problem like this and also having to create the solution that we will learn from this experience, we'll deal with this experience, and we'll be able to bring that to bear on other towns, whether they're here or across the state of Massachusetts. Identify significant data gaps in the knowledge of PFAS in Massachusetts and develop recommendations. Identify opportunities for public education. 
identify the sources of PFAS contamination and exposure pathways that pose the greatest risk to public health and the environment in Massachusetts, examine the benefits and burdens of various treatment and disposal options, assess how state agencies can most effectively use their existing authority and resources to reduce or eliminate priority risks from PFAS contamination and work to create possible funding mechanisms for remediation because we are aware here and across the state that this is going to take money to remediate. I know that we have been identifying sites that are responsible. I don't know that that gets everything remediated and so we go through all of this in the task force to look at how we can be most effective in bringing resources to bear in all of the communities. We're going to be very vigilant on this. If anyone has any concerns or questions, I will be here after, as all of the folks here will be afterwards to speak to you about any specific concerns you have. You can call my office, you can email, all the information will be out there. We're going to push through this together. I would like to thank the Board of Selectmen. I would like to thank the town assistant. I would like to thank all of the folks that are coming here from the state out of Boston to be able to give us a lot of information that I think people will find extremely helpful. And I know that together we're going to be able to work through this and I cannot think of a better group of people to do it with knowing and trusting that we will be able to achieve what we need to in terms of creating clean water for residents here and around the state. So thank you very much again for being here and I would like to introduce to you State Senator Jamie Eldridge. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. <clears throat> and I really want to thank uh, my partner in representing Hudson, Representative Kate Hogan, for her leadership in putting together tonight's forum, uh, reaching out to municipal stakeholders, stakeholders to get all the information that Hudson residents, and especially the neighborhood that uh, the PFAS contaminants could be affecting, uh, to hear all the information and to get that education out. Over the past month, I have been in touch with Executive Assistant Tom Moses uh, to discuss the PFAS contaminants. I have spoken with uh, D DEP Commissioner Marty Suberg. Uh, we really want to praise Representative Hogan's leadership for bringing us all together tonight for the legislation that she is going to file, which I will certainly be co-sponsoring. And really to highlight the recognition, I, and I think Chairman John Parent highlighted this as well, is this, not, this is not just a Hudson issue. I will say, uh, representing 14 communities, uh, there are also PFAS contaminants in the town of Ayer. Uh, those were created by the United States Army, so I'm working also in the town of Ayer to address those, and there's a forum in Ayer next week. Um, but the task force that Representative Hogan talked about, bringing together state and local stakeholders, uh, is so critical. Um, I grew up in South Acton uh, back in the 1970s. The company WR Grace contaminated two of the wells in South Acton. Those two wells are still shut down to this day. So um, that's a, a, a warning. It's in educational. It's also important to point out um, that Acton uh, to this day has extremely clean water because of the investment and because of the oversight and because of the enforcement. And I think um, the same thing can be done here in Hudson as well. So um, I want um, to be clear that my office is open and available for any comments. Please feel free to be in touch with my office. Um, I am also committed to securing state funding as different budget opportunities come up this year uh, with Representative Hogan. And um, I also just wanted to, before I introduce Commissioner Seward, I just want to recognize someone who will also be a partner on this, hopefully on the federal level, uh, is Joe Thibodeau, who is uh, one of the district aides for Congresswoman Trahan. And Joe, if you could just raise your hand, just so we know that you're here. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. So Congresswoman Trahan is also has a presence here as well, so which I want to thank him for being here. Um, I now want to introduce uh, DP Commissioner Marty Seward. Um, for those who are not as familiar with uh, Commissioner Suberg, 
I have just found him to be an incredibly vigilant public official, especially when it comes to environmental and water issues. Uh, Representative Hogan and I have worked with him on dozens of issues across the three towns that we represent, Stell, Hudson, and Maynard. And um, Commissioner Suber was, was previously, uh, before Mary Jude Pigsley became the regional director, he was the regional director for this area. So he's particularly knowledgeable about this region. Um, he has been someone that is incredibly responsive, recognizes we need um, to maintain vigilance uh, over the PFAS contaminants. And I would just say that generally, when you're talking about this from a, a big picture state perspective, I think what, what elected officials, what public officials need to look at is first of all, the investment at the state level to support communities like Hudson that have issues like PFAS contaminants, education to make sure that it's exactly clear what these contaminants are and also perhaps what they're not, uh, but also the enforcement and that's really where of course the DEP comes in. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask DEP Commissioner uh, Marty Suberg to come and address the audience and thanks so much for being here and please stay in touch. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator, um, Representative. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to, uh, we do have the slides up, terrific. Um, it's, um, as both the representative and the senator have noted, uh, we've worked together on a number of water issues and we're very much looking forward to working with you on the issues uh, related to PFAS in Hudson and, and as you note, in other communities in the area. And um, I also, uh, thanks to the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, as, as noted uh, earlier this evening by a couple of the speakers, we've been working very closely with the town um, as, we, um, as we continue to address this, uh, this emerging contaminant and, and a contaminant that is um, that is uh, drawing really national attention. Um, I want to just also highlight uh, Mary Jude Pigsley, the regional director, is going to speak after me. But we also have with us um, to the far left of Mary Jude, Mark Smith, who's the director of our Office of Research and Standards at Mass DEP. He's a very important person in the PFAS discussion. He takes the uh, health and toxicological information and helps us turn them into standards uh, that we apply and guidelines that we use to deal with situations when we find contaminants. And he has been working um, almost full time on PFAS issues for well over a year and will continue that effort and I'll describe some of the efforts he's going to be working on. Also, Mark Baldy, who's the regional head of the Waste Site Cleanup Program overseeing um, efforts to uh, make sure that contaminated sites, particularly sites that affect public water supplies, are addressed um, and, and you know, properly assessed and cleaned up. Uh, Mark is a wealth of information about the, uh, the where, what we know about contamination in town and, and how it affects not only public but private resources. And so Mark is here to answer any questions that may arise in that uh, setting. Um, as I mentioned, uh, PFAS is an emerging national issue as well as an issue in Massachusetts. Um, it is so much of a national issue and it has come on the scene very, very quickly over the past few years. It has become such a big issue that the US EPA convened a national conversation about it in 2018 with a couple of meetings in headquarters in Washington, D.C. and then regional meetings, one up in New Hampshire where that state is also dealing with a number of uh, communities affected by PFAS. Um, there, the result of those meetings has been uh, an, you know, a, a commitment by the federal government to keep working on the PFAS issue. But in the meantime, there are a number of states like Massachusetts, like New Hampshire, like Vermont, like New Jersey, like New York, that are dealing with uh, contamination issues and, and public health issues right now that we're eager to address. And so while the national discussion is ongoing, I think you will see both we in Massachusetts and our neighboring states are taking steps to address it in a more accelerated fashion. Uh, to date, there is still no federal drinking water standard for PFAS. When we think of other types of contaminants, we usually expect that there's a national standard that we're adhering to. Uh, that is not the case here, and that's what makes it partly a, a part of it a challenge for states to deal with. But 
but in the state of Massachusetts, we're trying to make sure that we are addressing that. We're also working not only with, um, with Hudson, but with um, five other municipal systems and some smaller systems where PFAS has been detected in some of the sources and to provide technical assistance and allow us all to design strategies to help us keep up with the emerging science of this contaminant. Uh, you'll hear about some of our efforts in specific with Hudson from Mary Jude and from the town DPW about how we're, we're responding to PFAS here. But I would like to set the stage on, on what we're doing sort of statewide. So I'll change the slide if I could. This slide just uh, indicates briefly the questions that, that um, I'm going to touch on. And obviously in the question and answer session, we can spend more time in this. Just a brief overview. I'm, I'm, I suspect many of you have been doing some reading and, and if you've attended other forums, you know a little bit about what PFAS is. But uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, minutes on you know, what PFAS are, how are they used. Um, then we go into how Massachusetts is currently regulating PFAS and what, how we plan to regulate it going forward. Um, a little bit of a comparison with uh, what other states are doing and what our schedule at MassDEP is for action. And then um, uh, a reference to the information that we have online. So um, as I indicated, uh, PFAS has uh, captured the national attention and certainly the attention of regulators like myself and in other states very quickly. A few years ago, based on emerging toxicology data, US EPA started a program to see how prevalent PFAs were in water systems. They, uh, it was called the Emerging Contaminant Program, or the UCMR was the acronym they used. Between 2013 and 2015, in Massachusetts, 158 public water systems serving more than 10,000 people and 13 smaller systems were required to test for six PFAS chemicals as part of that effort using then available testing and analytical data. Those techniques continue to evolve, but at that time they were using state-of-the-art information. PFAS was detected at nine Massachusetts drinking water sources above the reporting limits. Since that time, Massachusetts were anywhere where PFAS was detected in a public water system, we've maintained a monitoring program working with that water system to make sure that regular testing is occurring so that we know what is going on in that system. Our levels going up, our levels going down, how is the system uh, changing to make sure that we are able to stay on top of the issue and, and design appropriate strategies with those communities to uh, address PFAS. Um, in 2016, the US EPA updated um, a health guideline, which is not the same as an enforceable standard, but it reflected the state of uh, EPA's knowledge of science. It was uh, looking at only two compounds. Uh, I'll get into why that is significant versus the number of compounds we're looking at in a moment that are, are commonly identified with PFAs. Um, so uh, we have since then, um, thinking of this has evolved and states have taken approaches that look at more than two compounds and uh, the numbers, I will, uh, I will explain how they play out in a moment. So if I could get the slide to change, please. So what are PFAs? Very quickly, they are poly and perfluoroalkyl substances, a family of thousands of compounds with varying structures. Uh, they are, um, I won't go into a lot of the chemical ca characteristics, but that middle bullet you may have heard when you read about this in the papers, they're known as the forever chemicals because they are not very biodegradable. They have um, issues that, that um, you know, medical science has, asked, you know, has identified that we need to pay attention to, including uh, risk, developmental risks to fetus and infants, endocrine disruption, and longer term exposures, uh, what does it mean for, for cancer? Uh, slide, please. Um, as was noted, I think, by the chairman, uh, PFAS was, has and actually continues to be very commonly used. Their textile treatments, uh, stain resistant water repellent uh, uh, coatings, paper coatings, uh, grease, uh, grease resistant functions, some uh, waxes have it, hairsprays, waterproof, uh, manufacturing functions, 
firefighting foam, which has uh, been the source of uh, contamination in a couple of communities around the Commonwealth. And where I read a recent report that says you might even find it in dental floss. It is uh, commonly used and, um, and you know, still uh, very ubiquitous. Uh, slide, please. So currently, as I indicated, there is no federal drinking water standard for PFAS. So the way we have uh, approached it, and again, this is where Dr. Smith's work has been really important, uh, there has been increasing data over the past few years coming in about the toxicity uh, effects of PFAS, uh, the medical information that we should be looking at. Um, we in Massachusetts in 2018, after a, a, a several, a, a multi-month effort, uh, the Office of Research and Standards, um, after having it uh, reviewed by um, health effects experts in public health and in other fields, uh, set a guideline that would help us work with public water systems like Hudson and others to determine what is a, uh, a level that would, would uh, not pose significant risk to the population. And um, it is called an Office of Research and Standard Guideline, an ORSG. Um, that's, uh, that's the right slide there. It's an ORSG, and um, the, uh, looking at all the available data, we d concluded that uh, we should be looking at five compounds. Uh, the technical people call them long chain compounds. These are compounds that are generally regarded as more inimical to, and, and more uh, likely to present the public uh, health issues that I earlier identified. Um, and it was a, an OSG looking at five chemicals and if you summed it up and it exceeded 70 parts per trillion, that's parts per trillion with a T, um, you then uh, we would work with systems to reduce those levels. And in fact, um, our, our work with Hudson to date has um, addressed you know, those types of situations. Similarly, we have been at work with, with a number of other systems around the state that we also identified uh, with this issue. The, um, the, uh, the desire um, and the, the 70 parts per uh, trillion ORS guidance um, you know, concluded with this recommendation that we recommend that consumers in sensitive subgroups, pregnant women, nursing mothers and infants, not consume water when the level of the five PFAS substances exceeded that ORSG. And for the rest of the population, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, t steps were taken expeditiously to lower the levels of the 5 PFAS to below the ORSG number. Uh, obviously, for the rest of the population, the exposure time is, uh, is uh, you know, less acute, but nevertheless, we are uh, working with systems to make sure that they are addressing it um, in, as, in as expeditious a fashion as possible. So. Uh, slide, please. We've continued to review the, uh, the data, even though we put out an ORSG in 2018 for 70 parts per trillion, new data has come in. There is a new federal draft study. There are European studies. There is other information that our Office of Research and Standards has looked at. And, and we are continuing to evaluate it, and we are reopening our um, information on it and we are reopening our health effects advisory committee to, um, to determine whether or not we should be going to a lower number. And we are proposing both uh, through an ORSG and through another rulemaking that I'll get to in a moment that we adopt a more conservative number of 20 parts per trillion for six compounds which share similar characteristics. And tomorrow we are proposing a draft rule for public comment, and again, we want to make sure that we're hearing from the medical experts and people that have a lot of technical expertise. We'll be proposing a rule and opening a process for the experts to tell us whether 20 is appropriate. Uh, this would uh, revise our OSG and set groundwater cleanup standards for contaminated sites like the ones Mark Baldy works on. Um, slide, please. This may be difficult to see from uh, this may be difficult to see from the back, and, and we, uh, I believe we may have this slide up, or if not, I will make sure that it's up on our website. But um, we are not alone, as I indicated, in, in dealing with this. And the trend of information over the past few years 
has been to make sure that we get increasingly um, being, that we're being uh, more conservative about um, about values for PFAS in the water. Um, as you can see here, uh, US EPA has 70 for two compounds. Um, the ATSDR is a study that we're looking at right now. That's not a regulatory number. That's, that's uh, research that we're utilizing to where they're proposing uh, numbers that, that will be used uh, for health-based uh, determinations. But you can see New York um, has uh, set numbers uh, at the 10 parts per trillion for two compounds. New Jersey is in the middle of setting rules looking at three compounds with uh, values in the mid-teens. Vermont has set a number of 20 parts per trillion for five compounds. Again, Massachusetts is looking at uh, a number of 20 for the six compounds. Connecticut has 70 for five compounds. Um, California, Minnesota, this, probably the state that's been dealing with this for the longest of any of the states, uh, two compounds. And then New Hampshire just proposed its own rule looking at five compounds. And in some of those cases, they sum them up. In some of the cases, they look at the numbers individually to determine um, to determine uh, the, the appropriate number. Uh, there's, that underscores the fact that there's a lot of technical work that we're going to need to be doing uh, to make sure that we understand the approaches and that we're picking the one that is the most appropriately protective of public health. But it is a very active area, as I indicate. New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire are all working on it. Vermont is similarly working on new standards right now. So with that, uh, slide please. Uh, to summarize where we are, um, what's ongoing? Our work with public water suppliers. And obviously we recognize that as numbers are changing, public water suppliers are trying to do the right thing and stay up with us and make sure that they're continuing to provide, um, first of all, public notification. One of, the mo one of the best things we can do is provide notification. The public needs to know what the latest scientific information is. Secondly, um, we're working with systems like Hudson to design short and longer term solutions. You heard that there's already a permit in place for treatment for one of the affected wells that will, be also will provide longer term solutions. We're still, we're talking about what we do in the meantime until we get those, uh, that treatment in place. And that's a very active uh, discussion ongoing with the DPW here and I'll let them speak to that in a moment. And uh, we will continue to make sure that we are working with the communities on permanent treatment. What we are initiating now is our new regulatory approach, the revised regulatory approach that uh, adopts more conservative numbers. And then finally, um, what we will be doing, the rules we're setting do not specifically cover drinking water systems. It covers cleanup. But um, we have heard from a number of stakeholders, including the representative, including people uh, across the state, that we really should have a drinking water standard. We should not wait for the federal government to develop a drinking water standard. And so we are in the process of developing a drinking water standard that will govern all, all, all systems across the Commonwealth. It will govern how often we test, it will uh, establish numbers, and it will all help us uh, identify appropriate treatment technologies. So all of this work is ongoing right now. We will continue to engage with, um, with Hudson and other communities. Uh, we are eager to make sure that we are keeping the legislative delegations in place and uh, informed in, in, in places where their communities are affected. And then finally, on the last slide, I've covered a lot of information. Uh, we have a lot of information up on our website. Um, the information um, it covers basically the science that I very briefly summarized to what are we doing, to health advisories, to questions, to questions about uh, that consumers might ask um, if you're in the public water supply business, technical resources and um, emerging areas that we will be studying. So there's work that we will continue to be doing and um, I very much again appreciate the opportunity to, to be with all of you here. Um, I'm looking forward to answering your questions and now to talk in a little more detail about specifically what our regional office has been doing uh, working with your town of Hudson on both the drinking water and the contamination issues. I'd like to introduce our regional director, Mary Jude Pigsley.
Probably another 10 to 15 minutes. Well, it could be 20 minutes. I, I won't be speaking long. What I'd like to do is take from um, where the commissioner left off and talk about where all of this science, uh, what that means for Hudson, the specific data. And then I'll, I'll be followed by um, Jessica Borkhammer from the Department of Public Health. And I don't know. Well, I just have that some brief remarks. How long are you going to be in nature? You said the last question will be at 7.45. 15 minutes? Yeah. So I'll try to talk fast. Um, so as the commissioner mentioned, uh, there was an unregulated contaminant rule in back um, in 2015, and Hudson was one of the communities that was covered by that rule where EPA had a list of contaminants to investigate the prevalence across the country. It, Hudson serves more than 10,000 people, and so had to sample for, among some other um, chemicals, two of the PFAS chemicals. And on um, the commissioner's slide, there were two of them, the PFOA and the PFAS. And it makes a difference because the numbers have been changing along with the science, and then the data that's available for Hudson should be looked at in the context of what the regulatory, it's not exactly a regulation, but the, the standard against which we were measuring these things has changed over time. So I apologize if I talk in acronyms, um, but hopefully you can, you can follow some of it. Um, when the UCMR, the unregulated contaminant rule sampling occurred, any, det any system that had any detected level, any level of the PFAS compounds was put on a quarterly sampling schedule. So in Hudson, there were detections, and the water has been sampled every quarter since August of 2016 by uh, the Department of Public Works. The town is monitoring the water that comes out of the ground from the wells and goes through a treatment system and then is served to all of the customers. And I know Eric Ryder is going to talk about a little bit, has a, a board outside showing how the well system is set up. But there have been questions that we've heard about what is the difference between the samples in the wells and the samples in the water. It's all water. The water comes out of the ground. It's in the wells. We've sampled it there. It goes through the treatment system. We sample it before it leaves the treatment plant and goes out into the distribution to your faucets. The number that's significant is that last number after it's treated and goes out into the system. And that's the data that we're talking about. It's helpful to know the data related to the water in the wells, and it's helped us identify at least one source of contamination. That's not the water that you're being served. And I, there were several questions when we were out last time talking about this with the levels in specifically the cranberry well. And I'll talk about the cranberry well has been offline since February, and nobody is drinking the water from cranberry well, and hasn't been drinking the water since February. Um, so just very, very briefly, and Eric will correct me if I'm wrong, there's the cranberry well, water from the cranberry well goes over to the cane well, water from the cane well with the cranberry water goes up and around to the Chestnut Street well field where there are multiple wells. It's all blended together and treated and goes out. So since the sampling started in August of 2016, the treated water, after it goes from all the wells, gets collected together, gets served to you, that treated water has never exceeded the 70 parts per trillion for the two compounds that the EPA had set the health advisory for. So all those quarters of sampling, there was never an exceedance of the 70 for the two, which is the standard, as the commissioner's slide showed, for most of the country. But because we've been following the science so closely and it's developing so quickly, we did come out with the Office of Research and Standards Guideline, the ORSG, um, last June, and that's, 70 for the five compounds combined. So all of the monitoring data that I'm talking about is available through the portal. But again, when you're looking at it, you have to keep in mind what the numbers were at the time. And you can certainly contact me, my drinking water staff, if you go on that portal and you look at the data and you have questions. We have gotten questions from people. We're happy to take those questions and explain it. When we looked at the untreated water from chestnut well number two, on a couple of occasions, that did exceed 70 for the five, but that was not the water being served. The water going through the system from um, June, September, December, all the way through th 2018 was below 70, even when you added up the five. 
in a sample taking in January of 2019 that was reported on Valentine's Day, April 4, um, February 14th. Um, the treated water sample was 76 parts per trillion for the five combined. At that point, Eric immediately took the cranberry well offline and called us. By the time he called us, our first thing was take the well offline. He said, I already did. So the town responded very quickly and appropriately to receiving the information that that one sample had exceeded 70. The cranberry well uh, serves, offers 44% of the town's water supply and that level was 95 parts per trillion and that's why Eric chose to take off the cranberry well. It had um, a reading of 95 and it serves 44% of the town's water. That well has been offline since that date. There have been two additional sampling rounds in February, and those were both below 70 for all five added together. One was 56 and one was 60. So as a result of, even with the first round of sampling, um, we were asking the question, where is the contamination coming from? And I, well, I won't go into a lot of detail about that. We are going to be available after. Mark Baldy has a lot of information about the investigation um, that we've looked into for one of the sources. The source we believe is responsible for the contamination in the Cranberry Well at um, 51 Parmenter Road. On February 14th, we got the information. Five days later, we met with the owner of 51 Parmenter Road the former operator, Boyd Coatings, and the current operator, Precision Coatings, and told them this was their problem. They needed to fix the contamination in the cranberry well. So they have, in fact, designed a treatment system for the cranberry well. It's a temporary treatment system because, um, as the commissioner mentioned, this long-term treatment is very expensive, and we need something in place before a full-on treatment plant can be designed and constructed. We issued a permit for that treatment system for the cranberry well on April 11th, and I think site work is either underway or is actually completed at this point in time, so that's proceeding. Um, Eric can give you the details of how that will work um, in terms of reducing the PFAS, but it's supposed to reduce the PFAS to non-detect. So the treatment is designed so that the water coming out of the cranberry well that joins all the rest of the water will have no detectable levels of PFAS once this temporary system is installed. Today, separately from that, we just approved a permit for the town to con construct a temporary treatment system at the Chestnut Street well field that will treat the water from the other wells. So the goal of both of those temporary treatment systems is to have non-detectable levels of PFAS in the drinking water while in the longer term we look to design and construct a treatment system. So in addition to all of that, there is the issue of the private wells. When we saw the contamination in the cranberry well, looked to see what was around there, noticed that um, the nature of the industry at 51 Parmenter Road, the coatings that are used there have some of these PFAS compounds in them. We asked the companies to provide us with information, which they did. It linked them to some of these compounds. We asked them to do some sampling on the property. There are PFAS compounds in the um, former leach field area. There, is, uh, there are PFAS compounds in the stormwater runoff from the roof. So we are confident that we've identified a source of contamination for the cranberry well at 51 Parmenter Road. And part of the exercise has been to have them sample private wells in that area. So the people who are not tied into the public water, there's a, a small population of people who have private wells in the area. And they're responsible for both doing the testing and for any private well owner who has had detections, regardless of the level, offering bottled water to that, to that home. And we've sampled, I think, 21 or 22 wells and 22 wells, um, seven of the wells have PFAS levels in them above the new proposed number of um, 20 parts per trillion. But we have had the companies offer bottled water to any of those affected homes who have, um, who have asked for it. So yesterday, uh, MassDEP sent out letters to all the public water suppliers in the Commonwealth. Uh, and everybody got a letter explaining exactly the stuff that was on the slide 
about the sort of three-step approach where we are proposing tomorrow a cleanup standard for contaminated waste sites. We are revisiting the Office of Research and Standards guideline, the one that's currently 70 for the five compounds, and should that also be 20 for the six compounds as in the cleanup standard that we're proposing, and then working toward that, that um, enforceable standard um, unlike the federal government, we will have a drinking water regulation, which we don't yet, but that's what we're working toward, and what should that number be? So these three efforts are going on all at the same time. We've informed all of the water suppliers in the state for those systems that do have PFAS in the drinking water that's being served to the public. We've asked them, encouraged them to provide public notice to the consumers of the water and to take expeditious steps to reduce the levels of contaminants in the water to below 20. So we're happy that the town has been um, so helpful in working with us in taking a lot of information, a lot of data, turning it around quickly, acting very responsibly, and we look forward to working through this. It's a difficult problem. Um, there's a lot of good thinking going on, a lot of activity, and we're gonna meet, we're gonna meet that goal. So thank you. Thank you. I, for I forgot to introduce Jessica Borkhammer from the Department of Public Health. Thank you. Can I just make a Sure, of course. Go right ahead. Um, we're going to change the time frame. So we'll move it up to 8 o'clock. So we'll get another 15 minutes. Now keep in mind, too, that if your question isn't answered in the public forum, it could be answered outside after the meeting. Right, thank you. Pardon? Everybody wants to hear well, we'll do the best we can. Hi, um, uh, I'm, my name is Jessica Burkhammer. I'm with the State Department of Public Health. I'm here with three of my colleagues in the front row here, Shannon, Lauren, and Mara. And this is our first time here in Hudson, but the DEP has been keeping us in the loop about the situation here, but we're still learning more about what's going on on the ground. So we're here tonight to learn about the situation and to learn about your concerns and to bring those concerns back to DPH as a whole to talk about how we can best address any concerns you might have. Um, so we're going to be available after the presentation to talk one-on-one -on -one with anybody that has any health concerns. Um, so, uh, so please uh, definitely take that opportunity and if you don't feel comfortable talking in this forum, I have a bunch of business cards and you can also get our contact information from Rep Hogan um, or from the Hudson Department of Health. So, so I look forward to speaking with each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, you want to come up for a couple minutes? Well, Kelly is on her way up. Kelly is our director of the uh, health department. And I also want to make note that Jay Murphy uh, is sitting in the front row, anxious to get up here and give a half an hour or an hour talk. Uh, Jay is the uh, chairman uh, of the uh, Board of Health. Kelly? Good evening. Um, so at the Health Department, we've compiled a bunch of different resources for you. Uh, we sent out a letter for those who have private wells that are listed with the Mass DEP, DEP private, um, their well driller program. So we've sent out a letter with resources listing us as a resource. Call us. We have a bunch of information for you. Um, and then so the, so the department, so the Board of Health does not regulate private wells in Hudson. However, we are here for resources. We do refer to Mass DEP's guidelines and they recommend testing your private wells once a year. Again, that's a recommendation that's on the property owner to do that testing, but that is a recommendation that we do have. Um, but please follow up with me after the forum. I'm happy to answer any questions and give you any resources that you may need. And our DPW manager, Eric Ryder. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to touch base, uh, thank DEP for 
uh, working with the town. I feel uh, I have a new best friend with uh, Mary Jude. We speak daily, sometimes uh, four or five times a day. Um, uh, they stated that we did today get our approval for our temporary treatment. Um, the infrastructure is already being put in the ground for that. Um, my staff has been working around the clock to get that done. So um, I also spoke with the vendor. The equipment is on order, so um, there's more information to come on that. Um, I would like to uh, talk about how the water comes to each individual homeowner. We have three wells, um, the chestnut one, two, and three. We have the cane well and we have the cranberry well. There's a question of whether I'm getting water from a specific well. That is all blended together and comes out of one common point. We also have a surface water plant on the other side of town, which is the Gates Pond uh, treatment plant. That is not a groundwater, that is a surface water plant. So I did not put that up here, but that also contributes to the town. That has been tested and there is non-detect in that source. So um, just to reiterate, all the well water is combined at one point in the treatment plant and the finished water sample, as stated, has been below the 70 parts per trillion. So I just wanted to uh, touch base on that also, and that goes out in the distribution system into our five uh, tanks throughout the town. But if anyone has any questions, um, I'll be on the hall and uh, I'll be able to answer them out there. Thank you. Thank you. Our director of facilities, Len, I don't know if you wanted to come up. Do you have a couple words you want to say? Sure. Good evening. As the director of facilities for Hudson Public Schools, uh, my responsibilities are to test the water once it enters the school for lead and copper. And we do that on a th every three year basis. Um, it, the, um, it, it tests the performance of the building systems, how it delivers the water throughout. The schools are really no different than your homes. Um, we get what we get and we'll do the best we can to make sure that it, uh, it's delivered in a quality fashion at the bubblers, at the sinks, and uh, in the kitchens. I'll be out and to answer any questions. Okay. All right, why don't we go ahead and transition to the uh, question and answer period then. There is a mic over here, uh, if you don't mind either walking down and around or straight down. Should I just start? Okay. Yeah. As you uh, get to the mic, would you give us your name and address, please? Sure. Melissa Ansley. I currently live at 111. However, I was living at on Washington Street until June. Uh, my question is for the Board of Health. We've heard a lot about what's going to happen going forward in terms of preventing this, but we haven't heard what do we do about the fact that these are forever toxins that are in our system and I appreciate that you're changing the levels from 70 down to 20 which means that we still are currently potentially drinking water that's unsafe so is there science around how we protect ourselves or where we go from here where this chemical isn't going to be out of our bodies for at least eight years even as a half-life so is that going to be the board of health oh great or, I'm sorry uh, Thank you. Hi. So I'm from the State Department of Public Health. Um, and yeah, the science is changing and it leads to a lot of uncertainty. And you're right that the half life for these compounds is a long time. But unfortunately, we don't know of any medical treatment that can remove PFAS from your body. The best way to remove it is to 
just minimize your exposure. And unfortunately, the best way right now to do that is to switch to bottled water if your water has, if your water has PFAS in it. Um, and Should we be asking our doctors to give us blood tests to get a baseline? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are blood tests for PFAS. However, right now, they don't tell doctors a whole lot. Because we're learning so much about the health effects of PFAS, there's unfortunately no established level that we can say that you will have health effects if you have a level of this or above. So your doctor can't tell you if you'll be at increased risk for health effects. And it won't also tell your doctor whether you should have a different sort of treatment. Um, it won't even tell your doctor whether your exposure could be from water or from food or other sources. So unfortunately, There's most of the testing do. is, is okay. really related to scientific studies at this point to learn more. Okay. Does that answer your question? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Brenda. I live at 26 Pierce Street. Last week, I received a letter explaining some of the situation. However, it was dated kind of towards the end of February, and I'd like to know why. I think the letter that you're referring to was a letter that we had previously posted, and we weren't certain that enough individual citizens had seen that letter. So we took that same one and, and resent it to each individual. How was it initially distributed? I'm sorry? How was the letter initially distributed? I think the letter that you're referring to, we went to every utilizer uh, of the um, Hudson Town water. Is that correct, Eric? Uh, no, uh, that initially went on, that initially went on the town's website. Yeah. That was the requirement through DEP to post it on the town website. And then part of the requirement is, was to mail to all uh, residents of oh, the town, which we did. Okay. Um, and by the time we um, were working with DEP, uh, had the media printed, it had to go in the mail and so forth. That's why there was del delay time in it getting out to all the residents. But we did meet the guidelines on the DEP requirements and post it on the town website. In the future, if I want to stay up to date with what the latest information is, instead of having that information given to me, I should be regularly checking the town website? Uh, yes, you can check on the town website. You can also sign up for through the town website to get news alerts, and any news alerts or new information that's put on the town website will be immediately emailed to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Kathy. I live at 7 Ordway Road. Um, what has been told or possibly mandated to 51 Parmenter Road that they do to stop contaminating the water? Uh, are they responsible themselves for stopping that? And whose job is it to stay on top of whether or not they're doing that? Is there a deadline? Is there a threat of lawsuits or something to encourage them to comply? So I'll, um, I'll take a first crack at it and um, maybe turn it over to Mark Baldi um, for, for more details if necessary. There's a lot in that question, so if I miss something, let me know. Um, under the, the rules for cleaning up, contaminated sites. It's a privatized system that sets rolling deadlines and you have a certain amount of time to do certain things. And under that process, the companies are in compliance with those deadlines. That's a long-term, get to the end of the day, reach a condition of no significant risk, which is how you exit the system. What we've been having the companies do is a short-term thing that bypasses those rolling deadlines and says you have to do things immediately and that's called an immediate response action. And that's how we've had the wells tested, the private wells, that's how we've had the bottled water provided. We've also had them do investigations at their own property, groundwater monitoring wells, soil samples, testing the stormwater runoff. We are working with them to identify what the coatings are that are used inside the facility, testing those, seeing what the possible emissions are from those, and making changes. So for the immediate actions, addressing the exposure through the drinking water, we're doing those in advance. And they file status reports with us every six months. 
I think. Um, but we can, and are right now considering modifying that plan to have additional testing done. In the longer term, with the rolling deadlines, they have to clean up the site. They have to get rid of all of the source areas to reach that condition of no significant rich, no risk, no migration to private wells, no migration to the public water supply. We don't know enough about the site yet to say what that cleanup is going to be, but they are responsible for it. It's the current owner, the current operator, and the former operator are all working to um, conduct the immediate response actions and will be responsible for conducting the ultimate cleanup, which we anticipate is going to be both soil and groundwater. Um, like Senator Eldridge, I also grew up in acting with the W.R. Grace water problem. and. It's a little problematic for me that we are putting the people who contaminated the water in charge of policing themselves. Um, they have to clean up the water themselves and they have to do it over a long period of time. And they're the ones doing the testing. Who is monitoring them to ensure that they are actually doing this? Mark Baldy. Okay. Mark and his staff, um, we receive all the information, all of the monitoring reports. They're also on the, on the website, um, and I think it was John, somebody gave the release tracking number, and um, if you need it again, it is? 2-0020439. All of the data, all of the reports, every piece of paper, records of our telephone conversations are, are noted in there, so all of the information is available to the public and Mark and his staff review all of that. And as I said, under the immediate response action, which is um, escalated, you know, not the rolling deadlines, but the immediate actions, we're constantly reviewing those and trying to figure out what should we have them do next. And so that's an ongoing iterative process based on our review of the data. Okay, thank you. Tom McCoy, 25 Richardson Road, Hudson. Uh, the previous speaker took a lot of my questions away, so. Is there any in-house treatment facility required for manufacturers that use this stuff so they would clean up their own dust before it gets discharged? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are so many of these different kinds of compounds, and I don't know all the different industries. It's, it's hard to say that there would be one certain thing. Um, a, a lot of what we're seeing here and across the country is historic contamination. The, the contamination in the soil is from a former leach field. It's not current contamination, it's been in the soil. So um, I don't know specifically about treatment that's available for any specific industry, including the industry that's there now. I just don't know. And you know, I would also say one of the reasons we're putting together this PFAS task force is because there are so many unanswered questions like yours and that we will be looking at all of this as part of the task force in looking to move forward with um, treatment and remediation. Thank you, ladies. Yes, uh, Brian O'Neill from 31 Parmenter Road. So my first question is for the madam from the DEP. Um, how far back do the State Department of Environmental Protection records go that show ground contamination from 51 Parmenter Road? For the PFAS? No, for any contamination. I don't know. It became a site when we were investigating the, the PFAS, and before that it was a site for some chlorinated compounds. Do you want to talk about that? <clears throat> Thank you. There was a release of chlorinated um, solvents back in the late 80s and 90s. That was uh, attributed to Boyd Research Coatings, who was the operator at the time, they did achieve a, a closure for that release, but it was one of the factors that we took into account when we identified them as a, as a responsible party. Thank you, sir. And um, so we have a, a resident in Hudson, this business, that has a history going back to the mid-80s, and there, there have been multiple events. It's all public record. Um, that well was installed in the mid-1960s, the Cranberry Well, and it fed everyone unfiltered all the way up to Murphy Road. And so this 
also encompasses the time from the mid 80s until 2013 when it was redirected. So the schematic that um, Mr. Ryder showed is the current schematic, but that is not the schematic of the water supply in Hudson uh, up until 2013. So we also had, and I have a question for the Board of Selectmen, so we had two Board of Selectmen members that proposed a refining plant at that well a few years ago, and that was shut, that was, that was shut down, that proposal. Can you tell us why that wasn't taken into consideration, considering that we had a pollutant, a polluter from the mid 80s and that we're still dealing with this person? Put in the pipe. We, we, piped, it, we piped it to the uh, Chestnut Street water filtration plant. In 2013? Yes. Okay, and my final question is for um, Senator Eldridge and Representative uh, Hogan. So if we have a criminal act here, um, by this business, will we see the Attorney General's office get involved in what's happened here? So currently, the taxpayers are paying for this cleanup. And I, and I think that if, if anyone has read this Geosyntech report, um, and I know these, a lot of these people at Geosyntech, and they're Boy Scouts, um, it's pretty easy to come to the conclusion that we have, we have a bullseye here as far as a contamination site. So do these people get to just walk off into the sunset while we pay for this? So that's an excellent question, and I, and I think the, the reality is um, the, the laws required to clean up contaminated, contaminated sites, it's rather complex. So I mentioned earlier about South Acton with the WR Grace Company, um, which contaminated at least two wells in South Acton dating back to the 1950s and 60s. For, for many, many years, WR Grace did pay for that cleanup, but then WR Grace effectively went bankrupt and so then uh, the EPA since then has been cleaning it up. And so there are a number of federal and state laws that do include providing taxpayer money to clean up contaminated sites because the reality is if a company, um, which absolutely should be pursued crim criminally, but if a company does go bankrupt, at the end of the day you want to make sure that cleanup continues. And so there, there are taxpayer dollars, both state and federal, that do, do go to contaminate, uh, clean up contaminated sites. However, I totally agree with you that the Attorney General and maybe other prosecutors should be prosecuting corporations, but we also sometimes need to set aside state funding and federal funding to make sure that cleanup happens and we provide clean drinking water for all residents. Thank you. And if I can just ask one more question. I'm sorry to take up all this time. So with the proposal of the Eversource Energy Project, which would be to rip up the train tracks along the abandoned rail bed, the MBTA right of way, install an underground electrical conduit, which goes over most of our zone, zone two aquifers, and to spray that zone two aquifer with Roundup. Do you th and, and the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission, to their credit, have sent letters to Matt Beaton at the Secretary of, uh, uh, Secretary of Department of Energy, and so as, we, as well as the Energy yeah. Facility Starting Board. Do you still think that it's prudent that this utility should be able to come in and double down on the toxins that our town is being um, exposed to um, with this potential project, this utility project, on top of what we have? Right. Well, we, we, we've written letters also opposing that project. On that. I appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good evening, uh, Jeff Crodo, 41 Causeway. Um, I'm not sure if this was answered earlier, but do we have a current reading of what our water is? The, um, the, last, the last sample of the treated water for the five total was 60, six zero. And that In, was from three of the wells, the Cane Well, Chestnut number two and Chestnut number three. And is that from the February testing? February 26th. Are we still on a three month review or would we be wanting to escalate that until these systems are in place? It's um, on a quarterly sampling still. The both, both of the treatment systems are permitted. The one that the responsible parties are building at the Cranberry Well and the one the town is, is installing at the Chestnut Wells. When those are installed, we're going to go to more frequent sampling to make sure that it's working, make sure it's getting to non-detect. But we're, we're on the, the um, 
quarterly monitoring schedule. Okay. And um, at the last town meeting, it was described uh, that we could try to look up some safe bottled water sources. Um, I did try to use the website. I w maybe was not looking in the right spot. Do you have any suggestions? Um, as many bottled water sources are not as open in their testing. Uh, I, I apologize because I did say that that was available on our website and then I learned that the link wasn't working, so I, I apologize for that. I think it has been corrected. Um, the, I, I can tell you for certain because the department did the testing on Poland Spring. I'm not recommending Poland Spring, but to answer the question, um, we had that water tested and, and that does not have PFAS. Okay. Um, there are, I think, two other companies that um, provided us with the information and show that they had uh, non-detectable levels, but I, I don't know, and, and I do think it's on the website. And, and we'll, we'll make sure that link is working, because these were companies that voluntarily tested and, and reported the results, so if it was not working, I was not aware of that, we'll make sure that it's up and running by tomorrow. We also have that on our Hudson Health Department website, and we have sheets outside that you can grab before you leave. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca Wexner. I live at 135 Fort Meadow Drive. I'm actually, I have a couple of questions. So you guys had mentioned the tracking number. So I actually was trying that before. I'm, and like the man before me just said, maybe I'm not looking in the right spot. But the tracking number, when I enter it into the data portal, it shows up as no, it doesn't, it's not valid. So I, if you okay. could so here's, here's let the way us know to the exact website how to find that. I can tell you an easier way. Okay. So um, the, the data portal is, is for data. All the water quality data can, can be found there. Um, for looking up the waste site cleanup, this sounds, this sounds silly, but actually the mass.gov, the state's website, was enabled, uh, was, was modified so that when you Google something, it will take you to the right page. So if you Google MassDEP searchable sites, it will come to the page where there are boxes that you fill in and there's a, there's a box that only fits one digit, and it's number two for this region, and then the other numbers that Mark gave to you. And that will take you to a page that comes up, and it just has a, a line, 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 all the report names with live links to the document. Okay. So if it's, if it's blue, you know, if it's highlighted, you click through to that, you'll get the whole 700-page document to read. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Sure. So my other, my, my other question is about the schools. I understand that the water comes into the school the same way it does into the house, and so I'm actually curious because, you know, if we were in a different state, 60 would not be tolerated, right? If we were in Vermont, 60 would not be acceptable. And so I have a kindergartner, I also have a four-year-old and a three-year-old. And so they drink, ex at this point, exclusively bottled water. I cook with bottled water because I'm not willing to risk because what is the level, right? We don't know. This is evolving science. There are other states that have indicated that a level of 13 is more than enough. There are some states that say zero is the right level. So I understand that this is an evolving science. I understand that there are no hard answers. But I am a parent of three small children. And I want to know that when I turn the faucet on, I don't have to have a minor panic attack, worrying that there's going to be some long-term damage to these small children that I have do everything in my power to protect them from. And I'm... Do you have a question, please? I do have a question. Thank you. They spent 45 minutes talking. You can allow me 35 more seconds. So my question is for the schools, what system is the Board of Selectmen willing to approve to put in immediately to protect the water for the children? Because I have to tell my five-year-old, don't you dare touch the water in the bubbler. You have to drink this water from your cup or buy a bottle of water, which bottled water only perpetuates the problem. So I'm trying really hard to control my carbon footprint. I'm also trying really hard to protect the health of my child. So I would like to know what the Board of Selectmen is willing to do to install a filtration system into the school so that the school children who don't know and don't need to know are able to drink water as they need, especially for families who are not able to afford bottled water, cases of bottled water every week. So I would like to hear that answer. Thank you. I, in, in, the, in the short term, the temporary filtration that will be installed at... Will. I understand. I, I get it, right? No, but I, will, I understand. right? We're still future tense. Absolutely. And my kids go to school on Monday. <laughs> 
I get it. Like, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be confrontational, but like, this is obviously a very emotionally provocative subject, mm -hmm. and for anybody up there to have no understanding of that is infuriating. It's infuriating. And for anybody to say, well, we're gonna take care of it, we're gonna take care of it, I get you're gonna take care of it, why haven't you taken care of it? This has been going on since December. It's actually been going on, as Brian mentioned before, it's been going on for a long time. The levels have obviously been high for several, have not been high since December or January, but it's April. Why hasn't, why is this funding only being approved today, coincidentally? Why is that only happening now? Why isn't it that there wasn't some immediate action taken, imme like immediate, like, you know, 30 days time from the first point of contamination. I can, I can speak to that. The difficulty is finding a system that would work. There's, going back to our initial test when we discovered this in the water, I immediately came to the selectmen. I started a pilot program uh, three and a half months ago, prior to the exceedance of the 70 parts. I started a pilot program so we could have data that we could install the proper system because every, every town's water is different. So we started that prior to the exceedance of the 70 parts per trillion. Once that ex we had that exceedance, we went into, we were going down multiple roads at the same time. I initially submitted multiple design criteria through DEP to find a system that would work and work for the size of our system. We have a 2,000 GPM plant and I had to get a system that would work with 2,000 GPM. This is not off the shelf equipment. Unfortunately, I, get it. I, uh, we're down, I will tell you the town, you mean my staff, the water treatment department, have been working around the clock trying to find a system and DEP can attest to this, that we finally, after weeks and months of submitting data, we just received the approval today. And, they, and it's not a coincidence. Uh, as I stated, I talked to them three and four times a day asking for an approval. I mean, and believe me, I understand I have young children myself and I'd feel the same way. But I will tell you, we are doing everything we possibly can to get this in as fast as we possibly can. Okay, so the just, question is just, about the school. Can I just can add about that? The, um, we got the permit application at 4.43 on Friday afternoon and we issued the permit today. Okay. So we understand how critically important this is to everyone in the town. And we're working as hard as we can with the town to get this done. So my staff, I, I told them today that they're breaking land speed records for, for your government in action. So we've done everything that we can do to help the town move forward as quickly as possible. So can somebody speak to the, to the school filtration system? Because Right, is there something that can be done to provide additional bottled water to the kids to make sure that no children have to go without? Because there are some families who are not going to be able to afford bottled water after bottled water after bottled water. So is there something that the town is willing to do to, to pay for that? Well, Mr. Moses, maybe you can just give an update. Uh, we are trying to get a plan together. Uh, for bottled water. And let me have Mr. Moses give us an update on where we're at. Um, we're, we're actually working um, with the responsible parties at um, 51 Parmenter Drive to develop a plan to deliver um, bottled water. It's large volumes and um, vendors have time limits and capacities and tractor trailers and everything that they have to put in place. Um, we have to find funding for it because um, the town doesn't have an appropriation to buy a bunch of bottled water. So we're dependent on uh, the, the polluters to pay for this. Um, but we're working right now as we speak. Um, we've probably had five or six conversations today um, with MEMA and uh, with Poland Springs to try and come up with a plan. So I appreciate all that information. What I would like to say is that perhaps instead of the 45 minute PowerPoint show on all of the stuff that had already been discussed at the previous meeting, this would have been helpful information to present at the beginning. A little bit of an update on the plans that this town has been doing from last meeting to now, because a lot of what people were frustrated by at the last meeting was that there was not a lot of information about what is happening and what the plan is and specific dates. We are not stupid. We would like very much for there to be a 
a mutual respect. Let me just mention, as far as cost uh, on the uh, the bottled water, uh, and Tom mentioned that it's not something that we have in our budget. The estimated cost is about fifty thousand dollars a week uh, to supply w bottled water to all of the residents, uh, including the school. So it's a substantial amount of money. All right. Hi, my name is Matt Scott. I live at Two Forbes Road. Um, I had a couple questions. One uh, for Mr. Ryder, I think, is do you have an estimated time on when the temporary filtration system will be complete? Uh, thank you. Uh, our intent is, as I stated, uh, part of the infrastructure uh, pipe work has already been done. Um, I ordered the equipment uh, today. Uh, they're saying uh, potentially two and a half, three weeks. Um, concrete work has to be done. Um, we'll be working around the clock once this equipment um, gets put in place. We will update as uh, through DEP as we get closer. Uh, we'll have to do require testing prior to putting the system online. Our goal, my goal, I don't like to say, but we're looking 30 to 45 days to have it up and running. But that is all dependent on the equipment arriving from the vendor. As I stated, this equipment um, is not off-the-shelf equipment. Um, it is being built by the vendor for the town to meet our uh, criteria. Okay, thank you. And then um, on the two things on the internet and communication and that sort of thing. So. I heard someone say that the, the letter that was mailed out recently was posted on the website in February sometime? Yes, that, that was immediately uh, after we had the exceedance, after notification to DEP, um, we were issued um, that letter by DEP to post on our public website and that eventually was mailed out to all the residents. And the reason I ask is because I I've been signed up for the, the email notification, the news thing that you, I think you also alluded to earlier, and I, I didn't see that. I never saw that, that come through. So I'm just, I might have missed it. I don't know, but I didn't see it. Okay, so. it, it, is on the, it is on the town's front page. It was immediately there. It was tested by DEP the day that I put it on. Um, the link was there. Um, we can look at if you sign up again and make sure you sign up for all components of the uh, on the website okay um, and then on the uh, I'm not sure what to call it that tracking file that everyone's been talking about the release, two dash release tracking number release tracking um, it, is it possible or could someone at least explore this to get a link maybe from the town of Hudson website since I think we're all going to be going there more right to that that information I mean, I heard about how we can search it on mass.gov, but I'm wondering if we could just get a link. Yeah. We'll certainly try and get that on our health department site by tomorrow. Okay, great. So we'll get that up. Thank you very much. And then the last question I had was, I'm not sure I heard it right, but I think I heard um, the regional director, Mary Jude Pigsley there, say um, that one of the chestnut wells tested high for this PFAS. Is that correct? That's correct. Was that just once? Mm. Or was it multiple times? Both, um, both Chestnut 2 and Chestnut 3 have had PFAS in them consistently. And has, the, has any research been done on the source of that? Is that the same source or is it unknown? We have um, a contractor on board to do an investigation to look for what it could be. This is filters an effective option for homes and schools. We have a list of filters right outside. I can provide that to you after this forum. There's a list that um, we have. I don't know if DEP can speak upon the um, specific filter, filters that you mentioned, but yeah. I do have a list. Yeah, you know, generally carbon and reverse osmosis are viewed as the effective treatment. The caution we're expressing is that um, while we know generally that is effective, we don't have NSF certified units that you would, for example, attach to a faucet that would, re, you know, re, that, that we have seen the documentation or NSF has seen the documentation to say it will get you below 20. So 
There is one system that is an under sink mounted unit that, um, you know, it, 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 you know, it's a little more complicated. Basically, it keeps the water in the tank so it has more contact time with the carbon to make sure that it's eliminating the PFAS. That is an approved system, but that's a little more complicated than, um, than you know, just a, you know, a standard faucet unit. And that one is certified. We know that New Hampshire is doing a lot of work on it, Minnesota is doing a lot of work on it, but we're a little reluctant to say there's a particular unit that you can use just because, you know, what people want to know is will the unit reduce to the level below 20 parts or 10 parts or whatever the number is. And so far we're, we're aware of the one. I suspect over the next few weeks and months as PFAS becomes it, 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 this increasingly large issue, we'll have more of them. But for right now, that's how we understand the, the state of it works. Thank you. Elizabeth Mayans on Colburn Circle. Uh, what are the Hudson's numbers for the six PFAS? I'm sorry. The six. The, the, the six. six. The right. Six. So there's five, and then non Mr. Stuberg was talking about six. Yeah, so non what is the six? Non-detect. So the non six compound shows up as non-detect. It's it's the five that's giving you the numbers. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't have um, all of the analytical. Sometimes the, the depending on what lab. Sometimes they did not report out the six. It wasn't. It just wasn't run at that time. But when it was run. It's been non-detect. And when was the last time it was run for the six? February 19th. Okay, thank you. Diane Millette, 21 Cayuga. My question is posed to this table over here. If you are a mom living in Hudson with your babies in your forever house, paid off in 29 years, <laughs> would you be putting a filtration system in your house? Show of hands, please. Um, Show of hands, the table, the whole table. If you lived in Hudson, would you be putting a filtration system in your house? I'm going to I'm going to say that, you know, as we talked about with the last person, the whole purpose of why we're establishing these numbers is to establish a protective number. So if you're above the protective number, obviously we want you to be below the protective number. So whether it is municipal systems or an individual system, the goal is to get below the number. Would you be putting a system in your house? Okay, uh, I'll answer. No, I wouldn't at this point. I, I would be using bottled water in the interim until the controls are put on place, That's and then point. I'd be comfortable with it. Nice to afford it. Mm -hmm. Nelson Santos, 3 Santos Drive. Um, I have a four-year-old, and when he's acting out, I put him in timeout, and then I correct his behavior. As an attorney, when a client comes to me, and I need to stop irreparable harm from happening, I file a motion for temporary restraining order and injunction. Who at the DEP skipped that or just altogether thought, oh, let's just talk to them, get into an agreement, and let them figure it out themselves? I, I'm not sure I understand. I, I'm not sure I understand the premise of your question. The question is, is you've decided, or the DEP, not you directly, but the DEP as a whole has decided to allow Boyd Coating Precision to continue operating while they know they have chemicals coming out of their building right now in various forms. So why haven't you gone to court to stop them in the meantime? The way our, the way our program works is we are making them clean, assess and clean up the site and deal with immediate response actions. That if there is something that is an immediate inimical threat to the population, they have to deal with it. And so the discussions about uh, taking the action to address that is, is very much it related to that. Um, that's how our cleanup program works. If there's a problem, they have to deal with it. If it's an immediate problem, they have to deal with it immediately. So the DEP's attorneys have not have made a decision to say, no, you don't have to do this, just allow them to continue to pollute? They are. They're in our 20, uh, you know, I'll allow you to amplify, but uh, they're in our 21E system. If they have an immediate issue, they have to deal with it immediately. Otherwise, they have to deal with it in accordance with what our regulations require for the assessment and the remediation of the problems. We'll go where the evidence takes us. In other words, as Mary Jude indicated, if we find other responsible parties, we'll bring those people in. If we are not satisfied based on what Mark's review of the situation is, we will require additional action. 
Again, our, the 21E program is a cleanup program. I think you're talking about other causes of action, but right now what we are focused on is the cleanup action and making sure that they're cleaning it up expeditiously. You're cleaning it up and making it dirty at the same exact time. Right. You guys should have gone to court before and stopped them. Thank you. Yeah. And honestly, this isn't the town's fault. The DEP should have been on top of this. Yeah. Ronald Butler, 21 Woodrow Street. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is, uh, is there an alternate filtration system, not to fit under the sink kind where you run it through, but a container system? I have been living in my house for 45 years, and there was a time when Hudson Water, when you did backwashes, didn't come out pretty good. So I bought a tank, which I manually filled with water, with a filtration system that took out what had to be taken out. Is there something similar to that for FPAs? Yes. So there are, um, there are, instead of point of use, like on your faucet or under your sink, there are point of entry systems no, that no. treat all the I water I actually run in? the water into a bucket out of the faucet and I pour it into a tank which has, which contains the filtration system. And is there anything like that? That way I get out a bottle of water and I still have something that should come out the, uh, the right way. So yeah. as the commissioner was saying, the there are no nationally certified treatment systems to get out all five of the PFAS compounds that we're looking at to below 70. There are systems, and I don't know what the various configurations are, but you can look online. They are NSF certified to remove PFOA and PFOS, the two of them, to below 70. There are certified systems. I don't know how, how they work. How they work. But there, there is information available from certain companies that send. Is that, that what's outside it? Mm -hmm. you talked about? Yes, that's on our table outside. Okay. Second question is, gen is geared more towards our, uh, our federal legislators. Uh, we have an administration that is coming back on EPA regulations. How does that cutback affect a situation like this? I think that is why we know that yesterday um, there was a task force, a PFAS task force put together at the congressional level, but we fully intend in Massachusetts to lead on this issue, and so we have put together a task force ourselves, which we hope can move things forward more quickly and to be more effective and to be able to ask both the federal government and our own state government for the resources we need to do the cleanups that we need and to go after those people that are responsible. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Maureen O'Loughlin. I live on Wilkins Street. My question is really a long-term plan solution. I, I, I want to have an understanding, not the short-term solution, but for the long-term solution, what your intentions are as far as unregulated, not just for PFAS, but for other unregulated contaminants, because this is still unregulated, the filtration systems you're going to be placing on each of the new each wells or just at Cranberry? Because it seems to be that, as you already indicated, that there are three wells impacted, Cranberry being offline now, but two at Chestnut, which I think, out of all those wells, supply over 60% or more of the water supply for Hudson. So is the plan to change the filtration system long-term for all sites before it's blended? Correct. There will be, there's, there's currently going to be two temporary systems, one at Cranberry, one at the Chestnut filtration plant that will handle Chestnut 1, 2, 3, and Cane Well, and it will also treat Cranberry Well a second time. That's the way our configuration works. That's a short term. Short term. In the meantime, we've already hired our consultants. They are already underway in design of a permanent treatment facility at the Chestnut site that will handle all of our wells. Okay. So in conjunction with the temporary, we already have started design. That's why we started the pilot test originally some three months ago to look at the best form of treatment. I'm not a scientist, but there are other unregulated contaminants that are could be possibly monitored. I mean, like at one time over 100 years ago, mercury was considered a miracle drug. We have learned through time that it's not. So these unregulated contaminants, because the federal is not mandating the regulation to it, is the state moving up as far as 
overseeing all unregulated contaminants in water supply or only this specific one? Well, we, we paid attention to this one because, you know, of the, the compelling nature of it and, and because we, um, you know, like, like a lot of states are, are learning a lot about it. I will say, you know, ordinarily the way the system works is you get federal standards, but, but in, there have been times in the past, for example, perchlorate 15 years ago. The federal government still has not regulated perchlorate. We have a drinking water standard in Massachusetts for perchlorate. We've also done other things on other chemicals and uh, other contaminants. Um, think, think of iron and manganese. It's not, we, in that case, we didn't do a specific guideline, but what we did was another ORSG, and we're working with systems to, to uh, develop strategies to remove that because of the emerging data we've learned there. So yes, I, I think it's going to you know, keep our Office of Research and Standards very busy, but we make a determination uh, based on what we know about the contaminants that if the federal government isn't acting and we see that there is a, a, a need to address it, we will address it and, and have using, using a variety of the regulatory tools. And yeah, the purpose of my question is if we're going to go into a long-term solution mm -hmm. and we're only addressing this one issue, mm -hmm. that we may be designing a system costing the town taxpayers an mm -hmm. awful lot of money that we may have to redo or alter or change for other contaminants. And I want to make sure that when we mm -hmm. do something that we are all inclusive, not mm -hmm. just looking at this one particular thing. Mm -hmm. Look at it as holistically rather than a silo approach mm -hmm. of just addressing this unregulated drug. Yeah, we're, we're doing the best we can with it. It comes up even mm -hmm. in some cases with existing treatment technologies to make sure that what we're adding doesn't adversely affect other treatment. So we'll do the best we can. You know, the, it's the like thing. like medicine, you know, everything has a. Right, right. Yeah. You know, we're doing the best we can. You know, the good news and the challenge is that science is moving very quickly and telling us a lot more. So we're, we're, we'll do the best we can with it. But, but again, when we, when we feel and when we have evidence that suggests we need to act on a contaminant, we will act. And will we, as taxpayers, be informed before this decision is made as far as the approach. Mm -hmm. The next, the long-term approach, will we be informed before the decision the is made? The long-term approach has to be approved by DEP. We, once a design is put in place, a submittal will be in front of DEP for an approval prior to any construction. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Nicole Callio. I live at 110 Fort Meadow Drive. This is a question for my elected officials. I asked this question at the last meeting and did not get an answer. With the filtration system, and I'm sure the maintenance for that filtration system, it's going to cost a lot of money. Who's paying for that? Should I expect my taxes or water bill to increase and by how much so I can budget? Right now we have the cooperation of uh, the potentially responsible parties. Um, we're trying to keep it that way. We're trying to work cooperatively because uh, it, it is a lot easier and less expensive than trying to um, get money through the litigation process. So we're hoping to get much of it paid for by the operators of 51 Parmenter Road. Um, we don't yet know how much all of this is going to cost and we don't yet know how much they're willing to contribute um, to pay. Um, it, it, and as we've heard uh, with the with the stories of W.R. Grace. The one thing we don't want to do is push them into bankruptcy so we get nothing. So we're walking this fine line. We're trying to uh, cooperate as best we can with them. So you're saying our taxes for a water bill will be increasing more than likely? I don't have that for sure yet. I, I, let me answer that. Uh, uh, absolutely, w without a doubt. Listen, we're, we're going to try to get as much as we can, you know, out of the source uh, of the contamination. But let's be realistic. You know, somebody at the last meeting said, well, why don't you just shut them down? 
what are you going to get out of them if you shut them down? Nothing. So when Eric came to the Board of Selectmen and said we have this problem, you know, I need to do this, I need to do that, I can tell you that the immediate reaction was do what you have to do and don't be concerned about the dollars because as this woman over here who has the children, we, we do want to try and protect the town. So it, I'm telling you right now, yeah, it, it in all likelihood is going to affect your um, water and sewer rates, definitely. Hi, Wendy Hewitt, 597 Main Street. Um, I heard that 22 wells were tested around Parmenter Road from the, from the Cranberry Well, and I'm just wondering wh how it was determined which wells should get tested. Um, I live probably a quarter mile straight down from the Cranberry Well, and I wasn't notified in my well. I'm testing my own well for $375, but I'm just curious as how that was determined, what wells. So typically we start closest to the, the source and work our way out. Uh, in this particular case, we knew that the, the contamination reached the cranberry well, so we used that as a radius for testing everything within 1,800 feet of, of, the, feet? of the source. Of the, of the source? Of, of all of the land occupied. So do you have any uh, indication of how the, it might migrate? So, excuse me? Do you have any indication as to how the contaminate might migrate? Right. right, so <clears throat> when we did find detections mm -hmm. in that original radius, we then had the uh, responsible parties test all the wells within 500 feet of that well. If they had any detections, they would go out on, on another 500 feet. If they had any, they'd go out another 500 feet until there were no, no more detections within 500 feet of that last detection. Do you know where the last detection was was indicated? We have a we have a board out in the lobby, and okay. it shows um, 51 Parmenter Road, the Cranberry Well, and the um, the parcels that have been tested, and it's color coded, and the green mm -hmm. parcels are non-detect, so you can see where the sampling stopped by where the green. Okay, is. thank you. I would also like to make a comment. I know you said that you were testing your well as well. Make sure that the company that you're having it tested has the equipment in order to do so. We have a list of uh, companies outside that have that equipment to do that. Thank you. Um, Beth Langlois, 5 Appleton Drive. I had a question about exposure um, to your skin, showering, our swimming pools. Um, is there any research in, in is it, is there as much exposure as if you drink it? Um, yeah. Um, Fortunately for these compounds, absorption through intact skin is pretty low. So at these levels, um, showering and bathing is not something that we would be uh, concerned about. Um, what about know, not intact skin, if you have cuts or? Yeah, if you have significant cuts, like if you have psoriasis or eczema that's pretty severe, uh, you know, that might be something to be a little bit concerned about and shortened showers and shortened bathing. And little kids in the water, you want to be careful that they're not, you know, drinking or consuming the water while they're, you know, in the bath. Is there is there actual research to, because my daughter has severe eczema and we have a swimming pool and so now I'm yeah, extra you have a swimming pool yeah um, there is some fairly complicated research from a laboratory perspective looking at transfer across um, skin in petri dish kinds of situations uh, which does indicate some degree of uptake. Again, it's not really significant, but in your situation, if it was my child, I'd probably try to shorten the bathing and showering. And the, the chlorine in the swimming pool, does that oh, not goodness. eliminate? Yeah, the chlorine in the swimming pool, there are other issues with chlorine well. that are beyond, uh, you know, beyond the PFAS. Um, the chlorine isn't really going to affect those chemicals. It's not going to help break them down in any way, and it won't contribute to any formation of these PFAS compounds. Okay. Thank you. Um, one other question. This is for uh, Mr. Belli and Mr. Moses. Just back to the schools very quickly. Um, I know Mr. Belli testing the um, schools right now for their water levels for lead and I believe the PFAS as well. No. Lead and copper. Lead and copper. I thought because it was so, I think a parent had reached out to you and asked if you would also be including testing for the PFAS. Nobody's reached out to me yet, but that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise. So. I, I kind of leave that for the time. Okay. <laughs> the P, P 
PFAS concentrations are the same everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's the mm -hmm. schools, your home, uh, a public building. Uh, so if you tested it's, it's all, all over town, right. all the numbers would be right. the same. The number is tested at our finished water source. So prior to entering to the distribution system, that's the finished water sample. So whatever is at that finished water sample, it's throughout the grid same. of the town. Okay. So then just to follow up on that, Mr. Moses, I know you said you're working with I think the coding place to, to find out to, about getting bottled water for the schools. Do you have a time frame or any idea of how qu quickly we can do that? Uh, we'll probably have a completed time frame sometime next week. Okay, so we can follow up with you then? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you. All right, last question. Diane Schuster, 58 Deer Path. I'm hearing a lot about um, a solution being bottled water but bottled water in and of itself is an environmental hazard. So um, I would like perhaps somebody to put on the website and do a study as to what filtration. I mean, there are even individual bottles that have carbon filters that kids can carry, and it, and it you know, filters the tap water. There's reverse osmosis, there's carbon filters, and if there could be more information as to what people could do instead of bottled water. And the cost could be much less over the long run. So we have, we have a list um, of filters outside that you can pick up. Um, it only touches upon those two compounds, but like DEP said, I don't think that there is one that touches upon all six, correct? It's, it's, both, it's, it's, both all, it's both the number of compounds and the number that it gets down to. Again, when we talk to people and, or when our cleanup program is buying a filter for, uh, you know, in the absence of another responsible party doing so, you know, what we want is that it's certified, that we know it reliably gets the water down to a certain level. And right now, there's just not a lot of stuff out there. Again, I think that's going to change over the next year, but um, I agree with you that there are technologies, and in, and in a large scale, that's what the town is gonna use, but in terms of the individuals, there's just not a lot of data out there, and so we're, you know, we're, um, we're a little bit hamstrung. We can't, we can't do that research. We rely on groups like NSF to do it, and, and it's, it's worth checking, again, I think, we're going to hear from, I think we're gonna hear more from the industry because of things that are going on in Minnesota and New Hampshire and things. But right now, if I were, you know, I just wouldn't wanna give you false confidence that there was a particular unit if we didn't know and hadn't seen the paperwork that said it gets you down to this parts per trillion reliably. My understanding is that a lot of bottled water is also contaminated, yeah. so and, I think- and, and that's why, that's why we encourage some bottled water companies to test and why we've tested a few ourselves just to make sure that we know that, you know, we're not substituting one problem with another. But we agree with you. The longer term answer is to have a reliable municipal supply and that's, that's what we're working towards. Yeah. The bottled water also is in, the plastic has BPA mm -hmm. and that presents another yep. problem. Mm -hmm. Health, health wise. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. filters would be the way to go. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for all the questions. Uh, we will be moving forward together, and I just want to offer, uh, we will be having an open house outside. Everyone here will be out there. There is refreshments and a few snacks, so please uh, stay if you have questions, and I am sure we'll be hearing from all of you uh, very soon, and uh, we will be here, and we'll get this done together. Thank you.